Good morning and welcome to the Hard Luck Show. I'm certified host, Steve Lucky Luciano. Sitting across from me is my partner, co-host, Red Brother. Choo, Mahan Bowen, American Indian, Southern California, and elegant barbarian with part two of this fucking American kingpin. Yeah. Old blue eyes right here, right? Sean Lewis, certified audio professional engineer for the hard luck show. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, bro, did you look at the size of the the Cali? <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ, bro. I mean, honestly, it it's huge. So, what is this? This is it's vibes. A paper. You roll that. No, I know, but it's vibes. It's called the Cali. Yeah, that's the name of it. It's Cali. It's fucking huge, but like, are you supposed to smoke weed out of that? Yeah, maybe. Who the but fuck? That's a lot. That's like a fucking. That, that's like an eighth. Right, but like, what do you do? What do you do? You just smoke that for the next month or whatever. I think you just pull that out, and that's for like, you know, you have four or five friends. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And everybody wants to get real high, and Ugh. you pack that thing, and that's like a giant. It look like a giant cigarette. What? Giant cigarette looks like a motherfucking like Thumb. a cigar. This yeah. fucking thing look like a fucking. Anyways, I just wanted to send it over. To vibes. So, I mean, Catch you better be vibe. having good money to be able to fuck with those. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be making good money because you have a lot of weed to roll one of those up. Yeah, but if you're with somebody that rolls one of these up, you are gonna have a motherfucking good great time. time. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Cali vibes. Right. <sighs> So, if you were listening to the Silk Road Part 1, you have ended at the right place right now, because we're about to pick up Part 2, the told d- by the eloquent, <laughs> fantastically uh, crafted story by Chumahan Bone. Go ahead. Chumahan. With very carefully placed vulgarities <laughs> throughout the story. That got a little yes, bit of a uh, laugh from Obi. He is, uh, yes, uh, masculine. <laughs> totally in a masculine. And I hope man. your first child is a man. So, <clears throat> to where we left off. Totally in a masculine man. Yeah. So, this Dutch fuck. Now, listen. Yeah. This, so part one, we just got to the point where we got all these federal agencies mm-hmm. going after a drug dealer that might be the biggest drug dealer in the entire world who named himself after a character from The Princess Bride. Right. Uh, on the dark web, right? We're talking moving tons and tons of heroin, coke, meth, crack. You name it. Right? Chuck Schumer, everyone in the fucking federal government's like, we got to get them Duke boys. Yeah. Right. So they bring in the FBI, and there's this guy, I think his name is Chris Tarbell. Okay. Now, Chris Tarbell is on the cyber task for, for the FBI's. Big Lux, what are the, are, are you looking for? Pen. I don't know where that motherfucker went. It well, disappeared on me. How do, you know what, man? Sometimes you have stuff within your reach that you lose, and I'm yeah, like, how do you? see that vape pen, let me know, all right? I'll keep an eye out for it. How all right, go you, ahead. You, were, you didn't even leave the room. I know. I mean, the motherfucker just disappeared on me. Are you sure it's not, like, in a pocket? No, I searched every pocket. Is it under your hat? No. It's in your shoe? It's not in my shoe. It's, not in my it's like I hiding it. in plain sight. Where was it? It was in my chair. <laughs> <laughs> it was in my chair. All right. Okay. All right. It's getting hot. All right. Getting now, hot in here. So go ahead. All right, so... Very so they got thing. everybody going right. I I couldn't tell the story until we got Jesus that settled, Christ. bro. Come I can't. On, e- I go. can't be settled. Let's go. Now, I don't uh, know if you. Have my you... apologies, please. <laughs> please. Please, please. Entre vous, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Qu'est-ce que c'est? Qu'est-ce que c'est? 
<laughs> proceed, please. Proceed, my friend. I'm very sorry. <laughs> bun, bun, bun. I'm very sorry. Please proceed. So this, so they got all these federal agencies. Now the FBI uh, wants in on it. So they send the Cyber Task Force FBI, right? Newly created, newly minted. It's 2011. Man, it's fucking real FBI guys, but they're computer FBI guys. Then, <clears throat> um. They had just cracked some big case in their party. Now, this Chris Tarbell, right, was known for being, a, a, like, a really great FBI agent. But also, he was very vulgar. And he would do always, with the rest of the agents that were under his command, he'd do these would-you-rather type deals, right? Like, would you rather, right, have sex with a chimpanzee or... A deer. And then people would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And he wouldn't care. He'd be asking questions like that. Do you ever have friends that are like, you know, they get into weird would you rathers? Mm -hmm. What's the, have you, what's the, can you give us, do you know what's the weirdest would you rather? Was there, was there one you couldn't answer where you're like, yeah, I can't answer that. I don't fucking know. You're sick. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's plenty. There's been plenty. There's been motherfucking, you know, would you fuck a corpse? Would you fuck a midget? Would you fucking let this fucking, fucking torta suck you off? Would you, you know, like shit like that. Yeah. It's, it's always, bro. Mm. Well, I like I like those too. I actually like it because I feel like it reveals your personality a little bit more. Like, it, like, like if I was to go to Sean and say, Sean, seriously though, and you got to answer this question because if you don't answer it, you sh fuck a sheep or we you fuck a dog. If you don't answer it, you got to suck Brutus the Barber mm. beefcake off in a wheelchair. I'm I'm used to these from you. <laughs> okay, would you seriously between yeah. the choice? And we're not saying there's I like any. That. Yeah, between the choice, would you? have sex with a chimpanzee a female they're both female okay so there's mm -hmm. nothing homosexual going on in the bestiality realm would you rather have sex with a chimpanzee this is one of the ones from an fbi agent okay. or or a deer a uh, deer oh steve I, you know what, actually? I might think a deer too yeah because <laughs> a bug a chimpanzee would be weird yeah it'd be too weird Big pick a deer. Mike. That way, I don't want to look at it or anything, right? Right. Right. Like a, kind of like a goat. Go Big pick, Mike. I do the chimp. Oh, oh. What, oh and what's the rationale? She's looking for a little friend. He's looking for <laughs> yeah. He, he wants like, something that can he can yeah, look in the yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah. He'll have a little conversation while other. he's fucking. Huh? Better grip. Hold on to you. Should have his deer. <laughs> grip. <laughs> He'll rip your dick off, bro. Yeah, yeah, grip. Gotta go, out, gotta go out, bro. Got a blaze of glory. Fuck it. All right. Mm. King salmon. Yeah. Why? Yeah, I think I would pick a deer too. Just and, and it's a weird for me. It's a weird question because I feel like if you pick a deer, yeah, you're not looking at anything, but you're going a chimpanzee. Now look, I'm picking a deer because a deer just seems cleaner, right? Just seems cleaner. But if you pick if you pick a chimpanzee, I feel like that's closer to a human, so it's less bestiality. Like a deer is more animal fucking, and a chimp is more human. Mm -hmm. But I still pick the deer because it just seems cleaner. But anyway. Yeah. Right? Huh? You all right? Yeah, just like, God, I'm fucking grossed out about it, thinking about it. <laughs> hey, roll but up I'm one of them vibes. Myself, man, dude. That's so horrible. what you just... I definitely ain't fucking no monkey. <laughs> 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 Fuck that, dude. You know what I'm saying? But what if you, you close... Pull I just mount up behind the thing. You could be a fucking sheep, a fucking whatever the fuck. I don't know. And just... Pump and dump if I had to real quick. <laughs> I'm not into any of it, to be honest with you. Of course yeah, not. But, but what you just experienced, sir, is what these agents experienced with this. Epic. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's a matter of fucking. And so, and, 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 and they had just cracked a case, and uh, with the way they would celebrate Chris Tarbell, the FBI cyber squad, not the geek squad, cyber squad, they would drink whiskey and pickle juice. What? Yeah, yeah. Like cop shit. Yeah, I mean, that just sounds like cop shit. Right. But, and I would imagine, so you're saying that they just busted some other. 
you know, elaborate fucking thing, right? Nothing anywhere close to as big as this. So gross. But at the same time as this is coming together, isn't the sophistication of the of the feds and like on these types of internet and digital world aren't they increasing by the hour as well yeah they are like they're starting to address it because bigger shit's coming in every second right <clears throat> yeah and not only that but multiple fbi officers like fbi baltimore fbi whatever they're all trying to get in on this okay and they're all and it is increasing one of the things that's really weird Is <clears throat> I don't I don't recall if it was Chris Tarbell maybe it was Carl the the guy who <clears throat> was a dirty cop before and now is trying to like reclaim his name, but they try because they know the NSA. They know that the NSA has algorithms in listening devices and all this shit they could figure out, and so they try to get the NSA involved because. You know, at least for like a year, Jared, Carl, Chris Tarbell, all these motherfuckers can't crack it just because <clears throat> it's on the dark web and there's all these servers that are encrypted, mirrored, and all this shit, and everyone's anonymous, and it's Bitcoin, so nobody, it's, it really is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It could be somebody in the United States, it could be somebody in Europe, nobody can really figure this out yet. And yeah, they're growing in sophistication, but so are the crooks. So are the nerd crooks. Right. And the thing is, is the NSA could kind of crack it. And I think um, Carl, uh, when they were getting frustrated with trying to get the lead to this thing, uh, Carl and one of his agents went to the NSA and said, can't you guys just fucking... And the NSA was like, no, our mandate is only foreign enemies, national security. We don't do this shit back. Now, they went so far because, remember, Carl has an identity as Knob, the one-eyed Colombian fucking mama. So they were going to go online and sell some sticks of dynamite from them, like a weapon from outside in and then go back to them and say, hey, what's next, the atom bomb? Right. And at the last minute, they didn't they didn't go through with it because they thought it would create a fucking shit storm and they didn't know what kind of problems. And if they knew that they actually were the ones that bought the fucking shit and put it together, it would blow up the entire... Right. Okay. So that's going on. Now, on the other side, right? Now, fucking... Dread Prior Roberts and his friend Variety Jones and, like, these fuckers, right? They're on this whole thing. Constantly chasing stuff. Now, as far as the life goes for this Ross, you know, Dread Pirate Roberts, he's like living in Thailand and he's going to all these different places in the Dominican and he's got tons of money. Now the guy's got like hun like hundreds of millions of dollars everywhere. He's got thumb drives that he forgets that have ten million bucks on it and he's like, What I don't give a right. Fuck. I mean, money that's life changing. Right. That's just being lost, and he doesn't care. It's not really about that, and he can't really spend it. But now people are now one of his administrators or whatever says, "Hey, do we sell body parts?" And you know, Dread Pirate Roberts takes like forty-eight hours to think about. It. He's like, "I don't know. I don't want that's interesting." Mm. And then he comes back and he's like, "Well, fuck! If I'm a lib- <coughs> if I'm a libertarian, right? I mean, if somebody wants to sell their fucking kidney, who am I? Right? And apparently, like you, like bone marrow is like fifty thousand an ounce. And apparently, on a positive note, right? Like people who can't get cancer treatment for the bone marrow are maybe able to buy some fucking illegal Chinese bone marrow from whatever, and it helps them." Right, but you have to trust. I mean, you don't really know what's going on on the other side of these things. Are they killing people, or is it, you know, all of these organs 
being cultivated by a small little morgue in Atlanta. Right, right, right. <laughs> and your yeah. grandma's fucking kidneys just floating all around yeah. the United States, right? Also, guns. Guns. People are starting to sell weapons back and forth. Yeah, people were buying, definitely buying guns on the dark web. Just about everything except child porn and human trafficking was going on on the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And it was bigger than ever. Bigger than ever. And something nobody can do anything about. And the Dread Pirate Roberts was starting to really believe, like, hey, I am make, I am making a difference. I am changing things. I am doing this stuff. I, this is a great, this is a great cause. Mm-hmm. There was some kind of programming problem that happened, though. <clears throat> and for a, so... Without getting like, not that I'm a technical guy, but I don't want to get too bogged down in this. But essentially, every computer has a number with a bunch of dots in it. Mm. And that number with a bunch of dots is unique to like every computer. And it's kind of like an address. And it gets logged on and it gets recorded on these servers, on these sites, so that... For most of us, it's pretty easy to track where you went, what you looked at, what you did, da-da-da. Pretty easy. Real easy, in fact. Uh Okay. Now, on on the dark web, they encrypt, obscure, do all the stuff, so they can't find that, what I think they call like an IP number, Uh internet protocol. Sorry. IP address. IP address, internet protocol, right? That's your address. That's your fingerprint. That's a fingerprint. And <clears throat> without going into all of it, there's ways of entering places. Because cause, cause what would happen is, so what would happen is, Ross, the dread pirate Roberts, would have to frequently, he was getting paranoid. Now, more people were looking, and people were looking. So he was moving all around, and he started moving on. He was in Austin, then he got the Dominican, then he'd come back to San Francisco, and all these different places. And now, he had to rent under a pseudonym, and he had to, like, you know, pay with cash. And, you know, it's starting to get kind of dicey a little bit for him. But he's, he's staying ahead of the pack and all this other kind of stuff. But... One of the things that happened was there was a programming glitch. And so in one of the servers, I think it might have been in the Netherlands or Norwegian one or whatever, for a short moment, his real IP address got recorded into the server. So... Everything had got cleaned up, but it was like half a fingerprint was left on the wall, essentially. But this this digital fingerprint was left in a random wall, in a random part of the world. So you you'd have to sort of know a little bit about what had happened in in order to capture it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not going to reveal exactly how because I don't remember. But, <laughs> just telling the truth, I'm, I'm fucking recounting a fucking two-year slot. But essentially, the cyber squad, the FBI cyber squad, Chris Tarbell, discovered that um, the servers in Norway had this half a fingerprint. So he sent away to the authorities, and I don't know how he identified it, but he said, here's this piece of, like the internet, like a snapshot or whatever, send that to me because it has the laptop. Although it's encrypted, it's on there. Maybe there's a chance. Maybe there's a chance that we can crack it. We can crack it and we can find out at least the laptop, where that, that the, the number, the IP address. So <clears throat> they do it. Norway does it. They send it to them. I don't know how they sent it in a fucking envelope. 
and he gets it open, and Chris Tarbell's there, and he's got his tech guy there, and they're going through. Fuck, it's encrypted. And they try, you know, different little fucking things or whatever. No dice. Now, they're like a year and a half into this thing, and they can't find it, and they're tripping. So Chris calls back, and he's like, to the Norwegian authorities or whoever it was that sent it to him, he's like, it's fucking encrypted. And they're like, yeah, we sent you also the password. I was like, what? It's like, yeah, we sent you the fucking, we sent you the password. So Chris Tarbell's like, what? So they take the, they go and get the password, they put it in, and it all comes clean. Now, they have an untold amount of data that they can sift through and they're going to be able maybe to find maybe the IP address or whatever it is for this drug, for this Dread Pirate Roberts. Son of a bitch. At this point, all these investigations are clashing. Federal guys and everybody's fucking jockeying and not helping each other, whatever. So they have what they call, I can't remember what it's called, but they have a like a high up federal you know, cocksucker calls a big meeting of all of them, right? Yeah, yeah. And says, this is a meeting where we're all going to talk. We're all going to talk, and that's what it is. Now, the scumbag undercover guy, Knob, the excitement and the friendship and everything, and he's seen all that money, it just gets to him. So unbeknownst to everyone else, he created a situation where he could talk privately because when he went undercover, everybody, his superiors and everybody had access to his undercover discussions, right? Because he's building a case. But he needed a way to get away from prying eyes. Mm. And he needed to get over there and have a heart to heart with Dread Pirate Roberts. Mm -hmm. and, and so they do. And so they create this little digital room and he's able to go in there and they get nice and cozy and now they're you know he's helping he starts helping first he just explains how to do dead drops with drugs from uh, from internationally he explains what other drug lords do you know bus stop you leave the fucking fucking drugs right there and then somebody else comes by and leaves the money right there and two never meet nah, 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 nah. all this stuff stuff that went beyond what an undercover person's trying to do. At first, it was just trying to build some trust and rapport, right? And it starts getting a little bit more and more and more help. And eventually, he starts saying, you know what, I have an informant named Kevin on the inside of the... They are looking for you. Mm. I can confirm that. That's what Kevin said. Mm. I might be able to work out giving you some information about where they're at and where they're looking so you can stay one step ahead of them. Mm. It's going to cost you about $50,000 per, nice. nice. per info drop. Right. Now, by now, the guy's making $10 million a week. The guy wants $50,000. What the fuck is that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm. Right? So he's like, yeah, let's, okay, let's start, let's work it all out. All right, Kevin says. <laughs> uh, yeah. So while that's going on, the guy at the top of the Fed, the biggest cop of them all, says, all right, come to Jesus meeting, everybody. Now this fucking dirty cop starts shitting. Because what the top cop wants is all everybody to share information about right. where they've been and what their investigation is and what's going on. Right. Right. And they go to this meeting. I don't know, 40 people there. Now, there was one more federal agency that got into the game. The IRS. Mm. The tax man. Declare the pennies on your eyes. And there was a African American dude wore a suit every day. His name was Gary. And he read everything three times. Everything he read three times. And the reason was way back when he read an article that when you read, you don't retain that much information. So he figured if I read it three times, I'll 
capture, keep, remember, and be ahead of the game. So he was known as three-time Gary because he would read emails, text messages, newspapers, letters, books, three fucking times. And he was an oddball. He was good at his job as a finding tax malfeasance guy, right? Mm -hmm. Tax cop. Mm -hmm. Good at his job. But he would talk to people, and as he would explain stuff, he would say, right, like to himself. Mm -hmm. You know? You know? Mm -hmm. Right. And so sometimes people wouldn't know, like, is he talking to me? Is he talking to himself? What the fuck's going on here? This guy, he might have been a, just a touch on the spectrum. I have no idea. So he, they, the IRS is like, we want you, Gary, to get on this thing. And he gets on it. And he starts reading through everything, but three times. And he starts getting kind of excited because he's putting together details. And he's starting to say, wait a second. All of his texts are like this. And he says that. And he does this. And he does that. So at this come to Jesus meeting with Top Cop, right? Gary's excited because like, dude, now I'm going to shine. I'm on a real case. This is the Silk Road. I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to be the one. They're going to look at me and they're going to be like, Gary. Mm -hmm. He goes there. The first person asked to speak was the team of the bad cop. Now, the team doesn't know that the bad cop's bad, but he ain't participating. He's chalking it up that the FBI is scumbags, and if we say anything about our investigation, they'll just take it and then run with it and get all the glory. Mm -hmm. So we're not telling them anything. The real reason, though, was because this guy was a dirty cop and he was selling information. So the top cop was like, hey, tell us what you know. And they were like, We're not telling you. Section 23, some kind of code, but essentially Section 23 means it's deep, deep undercover and we can't go in it. Top guy gets pissed, frustrated, stops talking to them. Jared, right? Jared, the original guy we started with, heard all that. He had so many dead ends that he got up and he spilled everything that he'd put together, right? He just gets up and tells everybody. And he says, look, I figured out this pattern, this pattern, this pattern. All of the drugs that are like this are coming from this region. I know for a fact that it's happening this way. I've located this coffee shop, this coffee shop, but it's very difficult because X, Y, and Z and Chris Tarbell is so goddamn impressed with this loser custom agent's fucking thing. He turns to... The DA, and he's like, I want to work with that guy. I want to work with that guy. And sure enough, Jared, who had hit all these dead ends, the next thing you know, he's called up to be with the top FBI people on the biggest case to share everything he knows. And at this meeting, when they turned to Chris Tarbell, they said, what do you got? And he said, we got the servers. And everybody was like, holy fuck, that's it. Problem is, it was so big that that's why they brought in Jared to help them try to figure out where to look in the server. Mm-hmm. Gary, three-time Gary, who had cracked some stuff and was hot on the case, got so depressed because he thought he was going to be the hero. He just found out he didn't even have the servers. It's not his investigation. They don't give a fuck. He's late to the goddamn party. So he doesn't say anything. He says nothing. So now you have the top cops say now, Chris Tarbell, the FBI, Jared, the loser customs agent, three-time Gary, we don't really know what you do, but you represent the IRS. You're coming here. You got some kind of information. We don't know. When Gary gets there, right, he actually has, because he did a Google search for Silk Road. One of the things that three-time Gary thought is he said, how would I, if I was going to if I was going to try to advertise at the very beginning, 
of building the Silk, Silk Road. This is Gary's thinking. What what Gary actually thought was, and this is why Gary was an interesting dude. He said, "I'm gonna, we're gonna catch him the way they caught Son of Sam." You guys know how they caught Son of Sam? Mm-mm. Sean? Nope. Remember, Son of Sam was killing motherfuckers and sending letters to the fucking cops like, ha, 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 small dick, you can't find him. Right? And they were like frustrated, beating the brains out. Well, some cop figured out like, wait a second. Where all the murders are happening, I wonder if there's like a pattern to the parking tickets. Mm. Because... You know, if you're killing somebody, you're probably not trying to move your car, right? You're engaged in some serious activity. You're not going to go out and move your car every two hours. I bet you, you know, and sure enough, they found a pattern in the parking tickets to some yellow car that had an address. And when they went up to the front door and knocked, but the guy who owned the car that had just a strange coincidence of parking tickets on the same night at the same areas where these people were killed, the guy that answered the door was Son of Sam, and he saw the the cops, and he goes, "I was took you long enough. Took you long enough. You got me. What took you so long?" That's how they bought him. So three time Gary read that story three times, and he goes, "Hey, that's how we're gonna get right." So he says, "How if I was gonna advertise, or if I was gonna try to make people aware of this new drug site, what would I?" So he Googled Silk Road, and he looked, and sure enough. He found the over stack question that Ross had asked in his original email. Have you guys heard about the Silk Road? Ross Ulbricht. And when he met up at the multi departmental office and it's just like what you see like on the wire there's like you know lines and shit and fucking all this shit everywhere and then some prankster actually put up you know uh, pictures of people from the movie princess bride and drew all these like unintelligible you know arrows because uh because the guy's name was red pride all that shit you see in the movies was going on so gary gets up he's new to the party he gets there and he tries to tell him i did a google search now cyber cop Fucking Jared, everybody doesn't listen to him and laughs in his face. They're like, oh, you searched on Google, did you? Is that what you did? What did you find? And he's like, D- this guy, I, I, it might be Ross Ulbricht. Because he asked a question early on about the Silk Road. And they're like, oh, is that right? Oh, he asked a question, did he? Yeah. Nobody took it seriously. And again, Gary gets depressed and he keeps it all to himself. Keeps it all to himself. Now, the bad cop is like, man, when things are happening, we got to get it close. So the bad cop goes, I've got contact. And he's in regular contact with you. He goes, maybe I can get an arrest of one of the employees for Dread Pirate Roberts. If I get Dread Pirate Roberts to facilitate a cocaine deal and have it mailed to one of the employees, and that employee comes out and grabs it, maybe we can arrest that guy and be pretend to be the employee or something like that. Maybe we can catch him in the act. And sure enough, Nob, the one-eyed fucking Colombian dude, says, hey, I need to move about like $57,000 worth of coke. Can you help with that? Dread Pirate Robert says, you bet. Now, there's a guy named... Curtis Green. I don't know what his name was as one of the employees for Did this. Did he really have $57 million worth of Coke? $57,000. Right? Okay. Right. okay. 57000 Dread Pirate Roberts said, yeah, the, because the bad cop got another office to take out of the locker whatever $57,000 of Coke was. They even put it in a package and drove over it so it looked like it came from the international Right. And so this guy, Curtis Green, was a fat dude with two chihuahuas. Right. And like just I mean, kind of like dot com or whatever that who is that fat dude that changed his name to dot com. He like lived in Norway and made a torrent and made a fucking ton of money and laughed about it. 
Yeah, I remember. Billion.com. Yeah, I remember or that guy, but yeah. Okay. It's kind of like that, this Curtis Green, right? So, so the bad cop and the rest of the federales are staking out Curtis Green because this deal's been set up through the Dread Pirate Roberts and this Coke is going to come delivered by the post office to this address and if Curtis Green comes out and grabs the fucking Coke, then they know he's in on it and they can arrest him and they can start rolling him up, rolling him up, rat him out, roll him up. How does it work? Da, da, da. So it's huge stakeout. A federale dresses like a post office guy, walks with his package of Coke, knocks on Curtis Green's door and drops the package and walks away. And all the federales with their binoculars are just sitting there and nothing's happening. Like, what the fuck? Someone tipped this guy off. What's going on? Finally, the door opens and this fat fuck walks out with a cane. No offense. Cane. <laughs> and he goes, kr, kr, and he looks at the package and then he throws it in the trash. And the federales are like, what the fuck? Because, like, you can't arrest somebody for throwing a package of cocaine in the trash or whatever, right? right? Doesn't that? Then the guy, fat dude, goes back in. So they sit back. Then the blinds open, his eyes look. Fat guy comes back out, pokes the coke in the trash, retrieves it, and walks inside. Now they got him. And they come in. And it's like, FBI, blah, 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 and they rest him. His chihuahua was so upset, it shit all over everything. Yeah. And they got Curtis Green, and they got the coke. And he just, I mean, he just went limp. He just said, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now they got him, an informant. They got him. They want to roll him up. And <clears throat> uh, there's a little bit of a news article about it. Variety Jones says, look at the news, Dread Pirate Roberts. And he looks, and it, there's a little news story about this fucking bust. I don't know how the reporter found out, but they did. Now there's this bust. And they discover, right, that Curtis Green, the employee, had also stole like $300,000 in Bitcoin money from other users. Oh. And... So, Variety Jones tells him, what are you going to do about this Curtis Green? Now remember, this is a libertarian guy running an internet thing. It's about freedom. People should be able to do what they want. Variety Jones is like, you know what you got to do, right? <laughs> You know what you got to do, right? Uh, you know what you got to do now, right? <sighs> Righty Jones is like, I know people. Mm-hmm. Right? I can make certain things happen. It's going to cost $50,000. <laughs> Everything costs 50 Everything costs 50 <laughs> Um, And so, Nob, the undercover cop... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, some guy that every time you talk to him, every time you ask him for something, it's 50 grand. <laughs> Great. Go on, partner. <laughs> so Nob, who's undercover, is like, wow, what happened, man? And, you know, he's the bad cop. He knows what happened. But he's like, what happened, Dre? What's going on around here? He's like, I got to get rid of this. Blah, blah, blah. So Nob's like, yeah, we we can take him out. We can do it. And they even fake photos of killing Curtis Green, right? And they dunk this fat oh, really? fuck. Yeah, they dunk, dunk his head in the water and slap him around. And, and you know, we're like, we got to choke you just to make it look real. And they choke him out a couple times. And he's like, oh, uh, they take a picture of him with, like, soup coming out of his mouth. And, you know, they send it in to Dread Pirate Roberts. And like, we well, did what you wanted. We got rid of him. And, you know, Dread Pirate Roberts was like, it had to be done. You know, like, and this dude went. From doing that and having a little bit of a 
sort of a moment to think, like, is he really going to order the death of somebody to eventually hiring the Hell's Angels to kill all kinds of people mm. for fucking up? And and as after he killed one guy, if you went into the chats into the employee discussions, there was like a little bit more like, oh, he got a little cocky with it. Oh, he's some bass in his fucking text voice. Really? Oh yeah, we're not tolerate losing in this house, All right? Shit, listen, you gotta pay. You pay the price. You eat the rice, whatever. He's walking. <laughs> <laughs> he's walking around. Really? Yeah. He starts. I wonder he, if the jury's got to get that <laughs> understanding like that of this motherfucker. And he all of a sudden turned into hard ass. He all of a sudden he turned into motherfucking. What's his name? Who's the fucking Dick Stalin? Right. 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 Uncle Joe turned into Stalin. They're absolutely fucking right. Motherfucker. Well, yeah, it was I had like one girlfriend for a long time. Now all of a sudden he's ordering hits and sh- sh- shot column big time, big time. And his employees don't know who he is. So for all they know, this is El Chapo. I mean, right, they, they, right, they right. won't fuck with this guy. Right. Yeah. So this is going on like this for a little bit. And and the feds are getting closer and the bad cops selling money. But the bad cop, it's starting to get dicey to the point where the bad cop is making new um, identities on the Silk Road with more information about what the Fed's doing. He's pretending because he wants more money. <laughs> so, so he's now creating bunk shit that ton. ain't really going on. No, it's really going on, but he's creating new people to ask for more money. So now Got he's it. given like five different personalities. And one of them was somebody called the French mm-hmm. Maid. Pretending to be the French maid, okay? And he's talking to the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he's like, eh, you know, I, they finally have the name of a guy that they think it is. And I, I think I can tell you I'm the French maid. But he signed it Carl, his real name. He's such a fucking dipshit that he signed it Carl. And it took him like, I don't know, like, whatever, 10 minutes to realize what he did. And he meant, I mean, Carla. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> he tried to cover it up. <laughs> it's not Carly. It's Carla. <laughs> I forgot the A. <laughs> so now this back up knows that the feds are closing and closing and closing. And he actually put his real name on him attached to selling investigative, real <laughs> investigative information. To this. He's fucked. If he gets caught. If the Dread Pirate Roberts doesn't get caught, hey. So, at this point, Dread Pirate Roberts is living in San Francisco. Mm. And there's a coffee shop. We have a year on this, kind of, roughly? Yeah, I'm going to say this is about 2013-ish. Okay, all right. He's living in San Francisco. There's a coffee shop right around the corner. Now, he's got aliases. He's renting a, a, a an apartment everyone thinks his name is Josh <laughs> he's paying money in cash but he does know that they're getting close there's things that are happening to other em- employees and whatnot but he still thinks that they can't get him Julia his on and off again girlfriend got saved by Jesus is trying to convert him to Christianity and tell him to give it up and he won't do it he's a libertarian duh, duh, duh. And Ross Ulbrich, creating an escape plan, orders eight different fake IDs through the Silk Road from Canada. And two agents from Homeland Security. Now, when a fake ID is purchased across state line uh, across the international lines or whatever it's not that big a deal they don't right. really get that crazy about that shit they don't really necessarily prosecute anyone and they don't even notice it half the time they just throw it in the trash like i said they do about the drugs or whatever but eight was such a high number mm-hmm. that they decided we should go talk to this guy not to get him but to find out who the fuck is making all these fucking fake ids and fake passports and shit 
right? And we're talking like when they opened up the, the deal, it's a passport from China, and it's the same guy, same picture with with uh, Photoshop mustache, Photoshop goatee, all the stuff, right? Uh, okay. okay. And they have an address because it was being mailed directly to this guy, Ross. They have an address. So these two feds show up and they knock on his door. And they look through the window and they see a skinny white dude. And he sees them. <laughs> Bless you. And he oh, and he you. freezes. And he doesn't know what to do. But he's pretty sure they got him fucking dead to rights. <clears throat> so he opens the door and closes it behind him. He's got his laptop behind him. And he's like, and they go, we're from Homeland Security. Look at all these fucking fake passports you ordered. Like, what the fuck? And he, they said he was shaking and nervous and sweaty. He started swallowing weird, like his mouth was getting dry. He was, this was the end. And then they realized, oh, he's getting scared, so he's not going to help us figure out who's making the fake passports. They don't really understand anything about Silk Road at all. They've got the biggest drug kingpin right there. And they don't ask, they don't know anything about it. So they go, we're not here to arrest you. And he started to relax. And he's like, you're not? And they're like, no, 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 no. I mean, yeah, we don't want people making fake passports. But what we'd really like is for you to tell us, how did you get these? Like, where does this come from? And he starts getting cocky. And he's like, yeah, fake passports? Oh, yeah, that's easy, man. I mean, fucking... And he starts telling them about the dark web and the Silk Road. He's like, yeah, you can go on the Silk Road and order this shit. Yeah, you can order pretty much anything on this fucking shit. You can't fucking believe it. And these guys are like, what? The Silk Road? And he's like, yeah. Now, they're not part of any other government. They don't really know what they're doing. They have no idea. And they're like, wow, this guy's like one of those tech, like eccentric tech billionaire genius kids or whatever. Golly. And they write this report. So back to three times IRS Gary. He's like depressed. Nothing's working out. But he's three times Gary. And he says, you know what, man? I'm going to start over. And I'm going to go through this evidence one more time. And I'm going to see what the fuck it is. Now we're going into two years of this slog up shit mountain that everybody's been going on. So he goes over to the girl and he says, go into the database. <sighs> Start with Ross Ulbricht search. Now, they had already done searches on Ross Ulbricht. I got to count the hire in the back right now. Like, uh, do we, do we, do you, can you place market right now and we come back and do the last remind 10 me, minutes? Yeah, remind me that it's. Right at the time that they had already done searches for Ross Ulbricht. Okay, just remind me of that. They've already done search for Rock Robot, and that will toggle me. Because you're going to want to hear what happens after that, and then you're going to want to hear... You know, you should be recording this. Yeah. Oh, great. And then you're going to want to hear the fallout. You're not going to believe hey, what oh, they... yeah. All right, all right. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we can't we'll, fuck that up, but we also can't rush through it, because that's another 20 minutes. Yeah, easily. Yeah. All right, we'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah, Albert. Okay. Where we go? All right. So, <clears throat> listen. For everybody that's listening, we took a break to do another show for the Great Canal. Uh and you're going to want to listen to that. That dropped on Monday. I don't know what. I don't make it 411, I think. Episode 411. I'm picking back up where I left off. On American Sorry. American Kingpin, the story yes. of the Silk Road. Yes. Right? And I had, was just telling just you. Just about to bust a nut. I was just about to bust a nut. And I left off with <laughs> <laughs> Ross Ulbricht, right? And I had left. Oh, so where I left off was... He, Gary, three times Gary. Three times Gary. Said, do another search. This is his third time going through. Everybody hit a brick wall. Nobody knew how to get to this guy. Da, 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 da. He said, do a search for 
Ross Albrecht again. And they had done searches before and nothing came back because the guy hadn't done anything or hadn't seen anything. Nothing had, had come back. And he was expecting the same thing, but he was just thinking, like, maybe there'll be, like, one little detail that stands out, something that'll make sense. So the gal, the data gal, she does it, she, and she goes, she raids through the normal stuff, right? You know, oh, school here, da, 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 da. And then she goes, you know, there's a hit. We just got a hit. Mm-hmm. And he's like, wait, what? And in between the time that they'd run the searches on Ross Ulbricht before, and nothing came back. And the time that three times Gary ran it again was when Homeland Security guys had approached him about the fake IDs. And because they told him we weren't going to arrest you, he said all this shit about the Silk Road. And he had to show them his mm-hmm. real ID. So they got the name Ross Albrecht. But he wasn't getting arrested for anything, and they didn't know that he was the kingpin, so he didn't care, and they weren't arresting him. But they did write a report. They did write a report. And that report went into the database. And so Gary, three-time Gary, didn't think anything was going to come of it. He gets this report. She goes, there's a hit, and he just he like looked up and said, what? He was confused. And she's like, yeah, Homeland Security. You want me to read the report? He was so confused that he didn't say it. She's like, and he's like, yes, what the, read the report. So she reads the report. She says the whole thing. Gary Albrecht. He's like, what? Where's the address? He's got an address for this kid. San Francisco. When they had done the search into the server and they found that fingerprint, what they found was that the laptop had logged into the internet in San Francisco. Mm. And Gary starts getting kind of like hyperventilating because he's like, wait, what? He's like, San Francisco, yeah, Gary Albrecht. And Gary Al, uh, I mean, Ross Albrecht was the name of the guy that Gary had originally seen asking early on. Right. In Stack Overflow it was the same name. So he jumps up and he calls the FBI, everyone at the front, and he starts telling all of them this, right? And he's like, but he's stumbling over his words because he's so excited. He's like, it's him, it's him. And they're like, well, like, calm the fuck down. It's who? And he starts explaining it to him, right? They're on three, they're like on a conference call. Jared's not impressed. Uh, uh, Chris Tarbell's not impressed. Every, nobody's impressed. Nobody's impressed. Because uh, it could be a coincidence that they're in San Francisco and they have like a whole office full of uh, fake IDs and passports that were purchased through the Silk Road. And here's this IRS guy saying, no, I figured out who is this guy that nobody could figure out. It's this kid, Ross Ulrich, and da 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 And so on the phone, right, they're all sitting there. No one's that impressed. And so Gary starts walking through. He goes, and so Chris Tarbell goes, no, wait, wait, hold on a second. What? Walk through what you were just saying again. And he said, I went on to Stack Overflow. Okay. I saw the name Gary Albrick. And then he changed his name to Frosty at Frosty.com. And Chris Tarbo goes, what? And Jared sat up. It was like one in the morning where he was. He said, what did you just say? Stack. No, no, no. After that. What? Frosty at Frosty.com. And he, he goes, are you sure? And Carrie's like, yeah. F R O S T Y. Why? What the fuck? Yeah, Frosty, Frosty, dot com. And he goes, because the computer that we got from the server, it was called Frosty. Mm-hmm. And he goes, what was the address of where this kid Albrecht lived? So he gave him the address in San Francisco. And the half fingerprint at the cafe was right around the corner from the address of Ross. Albrecht. And 
it was like dead silence on the phone and the DA was like, that's interesting. Now, you go back to the Dread Pirate Roberts. Mm -hmm. Now, he's in San Francisco and he's feeling like, I got to move, change my name again. I got to go to Austin's. But he goes out with his friends in San Francisco and they go to the beach and they have this bonfire and the rangers show up and tell him, you got to turn, it's 12 o'clock, park's closed and no more bonfires, blah, blah, blah. What he doesn't know is that for two weeks, the FBI has been staking him out. Really? Thought <clears throat> they put a tail on him and they've been staking him out. Now, Here's the issue. Not they, right? Arrested another employee and the FBI, not the bad cop, the good cop, pretended to be the employee. I mean, mimicked everything she did in return for her not going to jail. Everything she did, learned everything and whatever. And so they were watching Ross the whole time. I mean, day and night. They had a uh, Suburbans going in circles with tinted windows around, I don't know what the radius was, but nobody would have noticed it. But inside, the FBI had a Wi-Fi monitor, and they were monitoring everything he was doing from his home. Mm-hmm. They knew exactly where he was. They were reading every time he logged on. They were doing all this stuff, right? Then they would follow him to the cafe and watch him. And what they were doing was every time he would log on, they would have their imposter that was on there. Is, is Dread Pirate Roberts logged on now? Yes. So they were building up this pattern. Every time he opened up his laptop... Their imposter on the inside would be like, yes, he's logged on. Every time the the pirate left, uh, they would talk to the people on the ground and they would have film of him closing his laptop and leaving. So they could at least say there's no way in a prosecution. It's There's no way that this kid was logging on, logging off, logging on, opening up and closing his laptop at the same exact time that the Dread Pirate Roberts was Showing up on the Silk Road and leaving on the Silk Road. Showing up on the Silk Road. They were developing all of this. Now, these guys, Chris Tarbell, Jared, all these guys, right? They're all in San Francisco now. And they're so close to capturing this guy that they've been going up this mountainous shit for two years for, right? But the FBI office in San Francisco wanted to Go in and take Ross with a SWAT team. And Chris Tarbell had already been down that road because he had lost many convictions when the FBI did a raid. They don't do it quietly. They bust down the door, yell FBI. And for somebody who set up keys on their laptop to encrypt make it impossible to prosecute him. Fuck up two years worth of painful fucking work. So, they go, what are we going to do? Chris Tarbell says, I'm going to go to the San Francisco FBI and I'm going to tell them, we can't do it that way. You can't go in with your SWAT. Ooh, da, 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 da. He goes there. He talks to the commander, and the commander says, you think I'm going to risk the life of one of my guys for a fucking laptop? You're out of your goddamn mind. We're going in there, guns blazing. And so all he could do was tell the San Francisco, delay him one day. And they had, so Chris Tarbell, Jared, three times Gary, and all these other folks that were tailing him on the ground, they were under strict orders to let San Francisco FBI handle it. But they had a day. And 
Ross Ulbrich decides to leave his apartment and go to the cafe right around the corner. Mm. Now, they don't have a plan, right? SWAT right now, San Francisco SWAT is running drills to make sure everything comes off without a hitch. Mm. But the bird just flew the nest. (laughs) And they're tailing him. And in fact, Chris Tarbell is in the cafe. He didn't, they didn't know that Ross was going to leave. He's in the cafe getting a coffee when Ross Ulbricht comes out. Dread Pirate Roberts, their guy they've been chasing forever. And everyone in the ground crew tells him in his ear, mic, like, hey, he's fucking, he's coming. And he's like, who's coming? Our friend's coming. He was like, holy shit. So he hurries up and gets out of there. Passes him in the street. They look each other in the eyes. Ross has no idea that probably 10 of the people around him and the guy that he just walked by have been watching his every move for the last three weeks. Ross, Dread Dread Pirate Roberts, goes into this cafe and he can't Mm. log into the Wi-Fi. So he leaves the cafe and decides, you know what? There's a library across the street. They got free Wi-Fi. I'll go in there. There are FBI people sitting on park benches trying to act normal. Dread Pirate Roberts goes up. He sits down. He logs in. Jared who's been an imposter, right? And he's been talking to the Dread Pirate Roberts, pretending to be an employee or whatever, realizes, I got to get him to log in and go to a certain place if I'm really going to catch him with his fucking hand in the till. So he pretends to be the person or whoever it was and says, hey, can you check a, a red flag? which would require Ross, Dread Pirate Roberts, to log into some sort of administrative section that only he can get to. And for whatever reason, Ross tests him and says, didn't you used to work at Bitcoin Exchange? Now, Jared is trying to remember, was that part of the backstory? And he can't remember. And this is a test. And he just takes a shot in the dark and goes, yes, a little bit. And he passes the test and Ross goes, okay, sure. What do you want me to do? And he sends him in. So now, Ross is inside this library. He's entering some administrative area on the Silk Road as Dread Pirate Roberts And this Asian woman who works for the FBI, but just looks like a regular Asian lady with a bunch of books, sits down right across from him. And he's on there. Doesn't, he looks at her, but she seems all right. And Jared's in there. He sees Dread Pirates in there. His ground people have told him, yeah, he's on the laptop and it's open. They've got him in dead to rights. And so he goes, go, go, go. And as soon as he says go, it goes out on whatever the FBI communications network is. So now San Francisco SWAT knows Mm. that they're actually going in to grab this guy out of protocol and early. So they hurry up and scramble and they start rushing to the library. And Jared and Chris get ready to rush in up the library, but they get stopped by one of the FBI guys, and he goes, let them do their thing. And so Ross is sitting there doing his drug kingpin thing on this laptop. Asian lady sitting right across from him pretending to look at books. And all of a sudden, a commotion erupts behind him. There's a man and a woman, and she says, fuck you! 
and everybody turns and looks, including the drug kingpin. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they look, the Asian lady grabs the laptop and pulls it away. And he realizes what's happening, and he looks, and he reaches for the laptop. And the people that were fighting whip out guns and tackle him to the ground and tell him, FBI. And when they hand over the fucking laptop to Jared and Chris, it's open up to the administrator's page. It's got everything there. And they're carrying it like it's like a fucking Fabergé egg. Like this motherfucker could break. They're like, and they have to keep moving the fucking mouse pad to make sure it doesn't go to sleep. All that shit. And by now, an FBI forensic. So one of the things that's crazy is that the FBI has a mobile digital computer forensic unit. This thing is as long as a yacht, white truck, with long gray tables with fucking eggheads inside of it, and their whole job is to break into computers on site. And they take that fucking thing there, and they make backup after backup after backup because they know they're going to have to go through this thing and pull all the shit out. Even then, Ross Ulbricht, right after he calms down, he's like, what am I being charged for? Uh-huh. Right? What am I being charged for? Because maybe they don't know what he is. Whatever, right? They go, we'll tell you when we get you off the street. You get him in the back of the fucking FBI car, and they hand him a piece of paper, and it says, United States versus Ross Ulbricht, a.k.a. Dread Pirate, blah, 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 blah. And it's got like a whole page of statutory violations, including the kingpin law, which is if you're running a conspiracy, then also attempting to kill people and all this other kind of stuff, you can just get 20 to life just for that one. Mm. He was facing everything. Everybody who knew this kid, Ross, when they saw the news, couldn't believe that it was him that was this drug kingpin. In fact, even the people who rented the room to him in San Francisco where he was were like, look at this guy, kind of looks like our tenant, huh? Nobody could believe, they couldn't believe that this fucking kid was the guy who ran the Silk Road. Mm. They caught Variety Jones eventually. They caught everybody. They were able to go through. What kind of time did Variety Jones get? Uh, I don't know. I didn't read that part. I don't know. I don't know how much time Variety Jones got. I don't know if he helped out. Or, they didn't need it. Everything that he had done, he didn't get to encrypt, destroy any of his laptop stuff. And in fact, he was even keeping a diary. They got him for everything, including <clears throat> attempted murder. What, what they did find out, they found no dead bodies. And what they found out was that it was most likely that the Hells Angels scammed this kid for about $350,000, telling him they'd killed everybody that he wanted killed, right? But at least from the evidence and from the printouts and all that other stuff, he intended to have them killed. Right. His trial was three weeks he had a three-week trial. They gave him a deal. They said, oh. 10. They go, you can take a deal right now before this trial starts, and you will give you 10 to life depending on what the judge says. He said, no, I'm not going to do that deal. He thought he might be able to beat the case. He, his lawyer tried to say that he was hacked. And that the real Dread Pirate Roberts had put all this incriminating information on his laptop. Because he said, number one, you know, yes, he did create the Silk Road, an early version. And no, it was too much stress, so he gave it away. But really think about it, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Would somebody with the brain and the ability to create the Silk Road, would they be dumb enough to put all this incriminating evidence on their laptop? It's somebody else. Mm. 
and they're pointing at him. Took the jury three hours to come back and convict him on all counts. All counts. So, the last play that this kid has, right, is his family and everyone else. Who know Ross as a good kid, a boy scout, wouldn't, you know, he was a very helpful young man. His mom, right, the judge was a woman, Catherine Forrest, turning 50, federal judge. Mm -hmm. His mom wrote a long letter, right, from mother to mother, don't give my son life. Don't give my son life. He doesn't deserve that. He's really not a bad kid. He got, he got confused. You know, it was a mistake. His friends wrote letters. Right? And the judge took a long time to decide what kind of sentence she was going to give him. And in fact... Ross himself addressed the court, wrote a letter and said, I know that there are consequences for actions. And I'm very sorry for that my conduct had harmed families and hurt other people. I understand you have to take away my middle years, but at least let me have my old years. Truly sorry. They brought in character witnesses. Hmm. Old high school teachers, coaches, everybody. Mentors. He said, finally, I'm going to start, I'm going to read a little bit about this because I just think this is so fucking fascinating. He said to the court, to the judge, Right. After hearing about parents whose sons OD'd <clears throat> on weird shit made in China that was sold on his site, hmm. right? he gets up and says, one of the things I have realized about the law, right, this libertarian, one of the things I have realized about the law is that the laws of nature are much like the laws of man. Gravity doesn't care if you agree with it. If you jump off a cliff, you are still going to get hurt. And then he gave a heartfelt apology. And then the judge, Judge Forrest. Mm -hmm. She started delivery of Ross's sentence. Mm -hmm. She was calm. She explained that she wanted to walk Ross and the rest of the courtroom through the exhaustive thinking she had gone through to arrive at this sentence. She began explaining that the site was clearly Ross's creation and that it was not just an experiment, not a light bulb moment, but something that had been planned for well over a year before it opened for business and that it was meant as an attack on on the democracy of the country which she had been appointed to protect. Quote, You were the captain of the ship as the dread pirate Roberts and you made your own laws and you enforced those laws in the manner that you saw fit, she said to Ross as she glared at him. It was, in fact, a carefully planned life's work. It was your opus you wanted it to be your legacy, and it is. Mm. No drug dealer from the Bronx selling meth or heroin or crack has ever made these kinds of arguments, Ross, that you're making today to the court. It is a privileged argument. You are no better a person than any other drug dealer and your education does not give you a special place of privilege in our criminal justice system. Mm. She talked about the collateral damage of drugs. She addressed the murders, noting that, sure, no bodies had been found, but that in her mind, that did not matter. Did you commission a murder? Five? Yes. 
Did you pay for it? Yes. Did you get photographs relating to what you thought was the result of the murder? Yes. As she came to a close, she looked at Ross and said, what is clear is that people are very, very complex, and you are one of them. There is good in you, Mr. Ulbricht. I have no doubt. But there is also bad. And what you did in connection with Silk Road was terribly destructive to our social fabric. And his mom's listening to this, hoping that he only gets 20 years or 10 years. The courtroom fell silent. He fucked up with those murders. He fucked up with those hits. Go on. 30, he was 30 years old at this moment. 30-year-old Ross stood and arched his neck upward as he looked at the judge contemplating what she was about to say. His mother and father sat in the back of the courtroom watching Ross as the, and the judge as she began to speak. Mr. Ulbricht, it is my judgment delivered here now on behalf of our country that on counts two and four you are sentenced to a period of life imprisonment. Mm. And then she added another 40 years to his sentence for the other counts. Ross stood there, unmoved by the words he was hearing. Behind him, in the benches of the courtroom, all that could be heard was the uninterrupted sound of cries. In the federal system, the judge continued, there is no parole and you shall serve your life in prison. That's just fucking... He really thought that he was not going to have to get a life sentence. He really thought, I, in my bones, when he said, I'm not really a bad guy. Yeah, I know I'm put this side together. I think he really thought that this judge and everybody was going to believe that he was educated and he really wasn't a bad guy and he had just kind of gone astray. Hmm. And this judge closed the motherfucking door on him. No second chances, no reprieve, no sympathy because you're not colored or you're not from a poor background. You're one of us. They made an example of this kid. He's 30 years old and he's going to spend the rest of his life in federal prison. And you know what? He acted like a tough guy. He thought he was going to kill people. He tried to kill people. And it, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I think about this story, I think about how some people who think they're fighting for freedom are only fighting for their own selfish freedom. Mm. They don't really want freedom for everybody. Like right. this kid. He's a libertarian. He says he wants to decriminalize drugs and all this other stuff. But when he thought someone stole from him, he had no problem killing him. Mm -hmm. No problem. When I think about our like where we are in a society today in our country, I think <clears throat> a lot of the people that claim to be fighting for freedom of speech and or freedom of this, they're really what they're really saying is, I want freedom for me, not for you. Mm. And I think that's why it doesn't resonate with the rest of us. Like the rest of us are like, whatever. On that kid. Jared, the loser who couldn't get any good government job and he was a customs agent, became a hero. He went from zero to hero through that case, mm. which is the other side of the coin of Ross Ulbricht. He was a guy, Jared, who all the He went from hero to zero. He went from hero to zero. And that, my friends, is the story of, of the Silk Road. <laughs> of Silk Road. That was great. That was incredible. Uh, that was I just crazy. looked up the, um, what's his name? Variety Jones? Yeah. Huh? So he hasn't been sentenced yet, but he's facing oh. 20. He's facing 20. He hasn't been sentenced yet. Didn't this he thing happen a long time ago? Yeah, he got picked up and they extradited him in 2018. And then I guess with COVID, it's been like, Delayed and delayed. Damn. So he, he'll get a sentencing next year. 
Well, thank you Look for that you update. Care. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Come wow. on. That's great, bro. Great story. Great. <sighs> great narrative. <laughs> Narr- narration. Dude, right three different shows trying to remember when we left off. You did good. You kept it up. Yeah. Kept the consistency the whole time. <sighs> Cohesive story. Oh, what? Yeah, what you got, Chumahan? What else you got there? Probably? I got, uh, got? I got, you got a lot of things going on. Right? I got Ovana Bone LLP. We wear braids to court, let the tomahawks fly the best. Legal representation money, money can buy. What you got there, buddy? What you got there, Dragon Ball? Dragonbags.com with a Z. Get to 21 faster. Oh, that was the dramatic. That was a dramatic one. What you got, Sean? Hardluckshow.com. HLS.gumroad.com. Yeah. Oh, That's right. What? No, bro. Look. You want you want me to speak on it? Yeah, speak on it. Yeah, I'm just uh you know, I'm not getting I'm not getting any hooks and I got other shit to do, you know what I mean? Oh. Yeah. And man. like I got this show. Dude, I don't know if you guys know. I it takes me like twelve hours to probably True. put together the week of shows after I get out, done with this. You know, so I just don't have enough time. I got my kid, now I'm trying to get a job and like figure it all out. Well, I can wow. tell you this. Uh I appreciate the twelve hours. Yeah. Right? To get the whole week out. Yep. Yeah, it's like video and audio. So it's, it's a lot. It's good. Right. It's a lot. All right. Chumon, what else we got? Anything else? Vibes, man. What's the matter? We got vibes, rolling papers. You, you want to smoke some uh, weed? Let me, let me, let me get, let me get, let me get you guys tuned in here real yeah. quick. Here. Now we got uh, vibes, rolling papers. Got the hard luck show. See that? Boom. Smoke some vibes at vibes papers. Uh, uh-huh. Big shout out to Burner and everybody over at Cookies and Vibes. Big shout out to Esteban Oriol, the Soul Assassins. Big shout out to Enzo's Pizzeria, our food sponsor. Uh, uh, Calco. Uh, we're, we're sending our best out to Calco and Pulpo Beard Oil. Instagram, TikTok, Jesus. We appreciate you. Always listen to Hard Luck Show, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And www.supermaxhardware.com. We'll get some Supermax. We are out of here. Peace. That's not true. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> right, my man. Right in my mouth. I had pumpkin flavored Oreos. Is that Chaka Khan? Is that Chaka Khan?